Hi there, I'm going to read Chapter 17 from Lila, An Inquiry into Morals by Robert M. Person. It was a long way to the hotel, but Feeders felt like walking it. After that blow-up with Lila, he needed to walk. The city always made him feel like walking. In the past, whenever he'd come here, he'd always walked everywhere. Tomorrow, he'd be gone. The skyscrapers rose up all around him now, and the street was crowded with people in cars. About 20 or 30 blocks to go, he figured, but these were the short blocks going up and down the island, not the long blocks going across. He could feel himself speeding up. The New York eyes were everywhere now, quick, guarded, and motionless. Watch out, they said. Concentrate. Things happen fast around here. Don't miss those horn honks. This city. He would never get used to it. He always wanted to fill up with tranquilizers before he arrived. Some day he'd come here without being manic and overwhelmed, but that day hadn't arrived. Always this wild, crazy, exhilarated feeling. Crowds, high speed, mental detachment. It was these crazy skyscrapers, the 3D, not just in front of you and in back of you and right of you and left of you, above you and below you, thousands of people, hundreds of feet up in the air, talking on telephones and staring into computers and conferring with each other, as though it were normal. If you call that normal, you call anything normal. A light turned yellow. He hurried across. Drivers run you down and kill you here. That's why you don't take tranquilizers. Take tranquilizers and you just might get killed. This adrenaline is protection. At the curve, he hoisted his canvas bag full of mail on his shoulder so he could carry it better, then continued. There must be 20 pounds of mail in it, he thought. All the mail since Cleveland. He could spend the rest of the day reading it in his hotel room. He was so full from that lunch with his editor he could skip supper and just read until his famous visitor showed up. The magazine interviews seemed to have gone well enough. Predictable questions about what he was doing now, writing his next book, what his next book was about, Indians, and what changes had occurred since the first book was written. He knew what to tell them because he'd been a reporter himself once. But for some reason, he didn't tell him about the boat. That was something he didn't want to share. He'd always heard celebrities led double lives. Here it was, happening. Junk in store windows, radios, hand calculators. A woman coming toward him hasn't clicked yet. That quick New York dart at the eyes, but she will. Here it comes, click, then looks away. She passes by, like the click of a candid camera shutter. This was, this was manic New York now. Later would come depressive New York. Now everything's exciting because it's so different. As soon as the excitement wears off, depression will come. It always does. Culture shock. People who live here all their lives don't get that culture shock. They can't go around being overwhelmed all the time. So to cope, they seem to pick some small part of it all and try and be on top of that. But they miss something. Someone practicing the piano upstairs. E-O, E-O, police wagon white flowers, chrysanthemums, $70, guy in the street on a skateboard, Korean looking, headed for Leo Vito's delicatessen, transients like himself who are overwhelmed and get manic and depressive are maybe the ones who really understand the place, the only ones with the Zen Shoshin, the beginner's mind. There he goes, lovers hand in hand, not so young either, a pennant of some kind in a half-open window two stories up, too far away to read will never know what it says. All these different patterns of people's lives passing through each other without any contact at all. Smells. All different kinds of food odors. Cigars. Above the window with a pennant, a billboard for Mark's furs. Something angering. The model. High fashion. High class. I'm so desirable. I'm so unapproachable. But if you have the price, you cheap bastard, I'm for sale. That price. Was it all for sale if you had the price? Do women really act like that here? Some, he supposed. It must sell furs and jewelry and cosmetics. Ah, it was an advertising cliché. Those guys were for sale. More candid camera eyes, some cynical. If he wasn't up to something, why was he here? It wore on you, that guilty until proven innocent attitude. He didn't want to prove anything to anyone. He was done with that. That was it. He didn't want to prove anything. Not to Regal, not to Lila not to her friends. God, what a shock that was. If those were her friends, he sure didn't want to meet her enemies. 
He wondered what it is about himself that she couldn't see when he was getting angry. Just now at the cafe, she'd gone for 15 minutes about what great people they were. And she never saw what was coming. She missed the whole point of everything. She's after quality like everybody else, but she defines it entirely in biological terms. She doesn't see intellectual quality at all. It's outside her range. She doesn't even see social quality. The whole thing with her on the river was like Mae West and Sherlock Holmes. What a mismatch. Sherlock lowers his standards by having anything to do with May, but May is also lowering her standards by having anything to do with Sherlock. Sherlock is smart, all right, but that isn't what interests May. These biological friends of Lila, that's what she goes for. They can have her. She'd be off the boat tonight. If this last meeting at the hotel went as smoothly as the others, he'd be out of here tomorrow and heading south. More eyes. They weren't watching you so much as watching out for you survivor's eyes. He had to step off the sidewalk to get around a steel mesh fence in front of a huge hole that went down now where there used to be something. Cement trucks at the bottom of the hole were pouring concrete. On the other side of the hole, the adjacent building looked all scarred and damaged. Maybe that was coming down next. Always something going up. Always something coming down. Change and change, on and on. He had never come here when there wasn't all this demolition and construction going on. Suddenly, he was back into posh fabrics and clothing stores. Saying what the city is like is like saying what Europe is like. It depends on what neighborhood you're in, what time of day, and how depressed you are. He buttoned the top of his jacket, put his free hand in his pocket, and walked more briskly. He should have worn a sweater under his jacket. The weather was turning cold again. The first time he was alone here, when was it? It was in the army, maybe? No, it couldn't have been. Sometime around World War II. He couldn't remember. All he could remember was the route. It was from Bowling Green all the way up Broadway to somewhere past Columbus Circle. He remembered it was a cold day like this one, so that when he slowed down, he got chilly. So instead of getting tired and slowing down more and more, he kept going faster and faster until the end. He was running through the crowds at blocks and across intersection after intersection, with sweat soaking his clothes and running down his face. The next day in his hotel room, his legs were so stiff he could hardly move. It used to fill his dreams night after night. When he was little, it was a giant octopus that he'd seen in a cartoon movie. The octopus would come up on the beach and wrap its tentacles around him and squeeze him to death. He would wake up in the dark and think he was dead. Later, it was a huge, shadowy, faceless giant who was coming to kill him. He would wake up afraid and then slowly realize the giant wasn't real. He supposed everyone had dreams like that, although he doubted whether most people had them so often. He had come to think of dreams as dynamic perceptions of reality. They were suppressed and filtered out of consciousness by conventional patterns of static social and intellectual order, but they revealed a primary truth, a value truth. The static patterns of the dreams were false, but the underlying values that produced the patterns were true. In static reality, there is no octopus coming to squeeze us to death, no giant that is going to devour us and digest us and turn us into a part of its own body, so that it can go stronger and stronger, while we are dissolved and lost into nothingness. But in dynamic reality? These manhole covers always fascinated him. Many intersections seemed to have nearly a dozen of them, some new and rough, others worn smooth and shiny, from so many tires rolling over them. How many tires did it take to wear a steel manhole cover smooth? He had seen drawings of how the manholes led down to staggeringly complex underground networks of systems that made this whole island happen electric power networks, telephone networks, water pipe networks, gas line networks, sewage networks, subway tunnels, TV cables, and who knows how many special purpose networks he had never heard of, like the nerves and arteries and muscle fibers of a giant organism, the giant of his dreams. It was spooky how it all worked with an intelligence of its own that was way beyond the intelligence of any person. He would never know how to fix one of those systems of wire and tubes down below the ground that ran it all. Yet, there was someone who did. And there was a system for finding that person if he was needed, and a system for finding that system that would find him. The cohesive force that held all these systems together, that was the giant. When he was young, feeders used to think about cows and pigs and chickens, 
and how they never knew that the nice farmer who provided food and shelter was doing so only that he could sell them to be killed and eaten. They would oink or cluck, and he would come with food, so they probably thought he was some sort of servant. He used to wonder if there was a higher farmer that did the same thing to people. Later he saw there was this giant. People look upon the social patterns of the giant in the same way cows and horses look upon a farmer, different from themselves, incomprehensible, but benevolent and appealing. Yet the social patterns of the city devours their lives for its own purposes, just as surely as farmers devour the flesh of farm animals. A higher organism is feeding upon a lower one and accomplishing more by doing so than the lower organism can accomplish alone. The metaphysics of substance makes it difficult to see the giant. It makes it customary to think of a city like New York as a work of man. But what man invented it? What group of men invented it? Who sat around and thought up how it should all go together? If man invented societies and cities, why are all societies and cities repressive of man? Why would man want to invent internally contradictory standards and arbitrary social institutions for the purpose of giving himself a bad time? This man who goes around inventing societies to repress himself seems real as long as you deal with them in the abstract, but he evaporates it as you get more specific. Sometimes people think there are some evil individual men somewhere who are exploiting them, some secret cabal of capitalists or 400, or Wall Street bankers, or WASPs, or name any minority group that gets together periodically and has secret conferences on how to exploit them personally. These men are supposed to be enemies of man. It gets confusing, but nobody seems to notice the confusion. A metaphysics of substance makes us think that all evolution stops with the highest evolved substance, the physical body of man. It makes us think that cities and societies and thought structures are all subordinate creations to this physical body of man. But it's as foolish to think of a city or a society as created by human bodies as it is to think of human bodies as a creation of the cells or to think of cells as created by protein and DNA molecules or to think of DNA as created by carbon and other inorganic atoms. If you follow that fallacy long enough, you come out with the conclusion that individual electrons contain the intelligence needed to build New York City all by themselves. Absurd. If it's possible to imagine two red blood cells sitting side by side asking, will there ever be a higher form of evolution than us? And looking around and seeing nothing and deciding there isn't, you can imagine the ridiculousness of two people walking down a street of Manhattan asking if there will ever be any form of evolution higher than man meaning biological man. Biological man doesn't invent cities or societies any more than pigs and chickens invent the farmer that feeds them. The force of evolutionary creation isn't contained by substance. Substance is just one kind of static pattern left behind by the creative force. The city is another static pattern left behind by the creative force. It is composed of substance, but substance doesn't create it all by itself. Neither did a biological organism called man create it all by himself. The city is a higher pattern than either substance or a biological pattern called man. Just as biology exploits substance for its own purposes, so does this social pattern called a city exploit biology for its own purposes. Just as a farmer raises cows for the sole purpose of devouring them, this pattern grows living human beings for the sole purpose of devouring them. That is what the giant really does. It converts accumulated biological energy into forms that serve itself. When societies and cultures and cities are seen not as inventions of man, but as higher organisms than biological man, the phenomena of war and genocide and all the other forms of human exploitation become more intelligible. Mankind has never been interested in getting itself killed. But the superorganism, the giant, who is a pattern of values superimposed on top of biological human bodies, doesn't mind losing a few bodies to protect his greater interests. The giant began to materialize out of Peters's dynamic dreams when he was in college. A professor of chemistry had mentioned at his fraternity that a large chemical firm was offering excellent jobs for graduates of the school, and almost every member of the fraternity thought it was wonderful news. World War II had just ended, and good jobs were all that anyone seemed to think of. The revolution of the 60s was still 20 years off, 
No one had thought of making the film The Graduate back then. Fedris had always believed science is a search for truth. A real scientist is not supposed to sell out that goal to corporations who are searching for mere profit. Or, if he had to sell out in order to live, it was nothing to be happy about. These fraternity brothers of his acted like they'd never heard of science as truth. Fedris had suddenly seen a tentacle of the giant reaching out, and he was the only one who could see it. So here was this giant, this nameless, faceless system reaching out for him, ready to devour him and digest him. It would use his energy to grow stronger and stronger throughout his life, while he grew older and weaker, until, when he was no longer of much use, it would excrete him and find another younger person, full of energy, to take his place and do the same thing all over again. That was why he had to run that day through all this traffic, through all these systems and subsystems of the island. He was on his way to India, done with this corporate pseudoscience, still pursuing truth, knowing that to find it, he would have to get free of the giant first. Here up in the sky above him, right now, were the heads of the corporation that had prompted the chemistry professor to make that talk to the fraternity so many years ago. This was the brain center of that corporate network, surrounded by other networks, financial networks, information networks, electronic transmission networks. That's what all those tiny bodies were doing up there, suspended so many hundreds of feet up in the sky, participating in the giant. So Friedrich had been right in running then, but now, funny thought, this was actually his home. All his income came from here. His only fixed address now was right here his publisher's address on Madison Avenue. That was as much a part of the giant as anyone else. When you understand something well enough, you don't need to run from it. In recent years, each time he'd returned to New York, he could feel his fear of this old monster lessening and a kind of familiar affection for it growing. From a metaphysics of qualities point of view, this devouring of human bodies is a moral activity because it's more moral for a social pattern to devour a biological pattern than for a biological pattern to devour a social pattern. A social pattern is a higher form of evolution. The city, in its endless devouring of human bodies, was creating something better than any biological organism could ever achieve. Well, of course, my God, look at it. The power of this place, fantastic. What individual work of art can come anywhere near equaling it? Sure, dirty, noisy, rude, dangerous, expensive, always has been and probably always will be. Always been a hellhole if what you're looking for is stability and serenity. But if you're looking for stability and serenity, go to a cemetery. Don't come here. This is the most dynamic place on earth. Now Fedris felt it all around him. The speed, the height, the crowds, and their tension. All the early strangeness was gone now. He was in it. He remembered that its great symbol used to be the ticker tape ticking out unpredictable fortunes rising and falling every second. A great symbol of luck. Luck. When E.B. White wrote, If you want to live in New York, when E.B. White wrote, If you want to live in New York, you should be willing to be lucky. He meant not just lucky, but willing to be lucky. That is dynamic. If you cling to some set, static pattern, when opportunity comes, you won't take it. You have to hang loose. And when the time comes to be lucky, and be lucky. That's dynamic. When they call it freedom, that's not right. Freedom doesn't mean anything. Freedom's just an escape from something negative. The real reason it's so hallowed is that when people talk about it, they mean dynamic quality. That's what neither the socialists nor the capitalists ever got figured out. From a static point of view, socialism is more moral than capitalism. It's a higher form of evolution. It is an intellectually guided society not just a society that is guided by mindless traditions. That's what gives socialism its drive. But what the socialists left out, and what has all but killed their whole undertaking, is an absence of a concept of indefinite dynamic quality. You go to any socialist city and it's always a dull place because there's little dynamic quality. On the other hand, the conservatives, who keep trumpeting about the virtues of free enterprise, are normally just supporting their own self-interest. They are just doing the usual cover-up for the rich in their age-old exploitation of the poor. Some of them seem to sense that there is also something mysteriously virtuous in a free enterprise system, and you can see them struggling to put it into words, 
but they don't have the metaphysical vocabulary for it any more than the socialists do. The metaphysics of quality provides the vocabulary. A free market is a dynamic institution. What people buy and what people sell, in other words, what people value, can never be contained by any intellectual formula. What makes the marketplace work is dynamic quality. The market is always changing, and the direction of that change can never be predetermined. The metaphysics of quality says that the free market makes everybody richer by preventing static economic patterns from setting in and stagnating economic growth. That is the reason the major capitalist economies of the world have done so much better since World War II than the major socialist economies. It's not that the Victorian social economic patterns are more moral than socialist intellectual economic patterns. Quite the opposite. They are less moral, as static patterns go. What makes the free enterprise system superior is that the socialists, reasoning intelligently and objectively, have inadvertently closed the door to dynamic quality in the buying and selling of things. They closed it because the metaphysical structure of their objectivity never told them dynamic quality exists. People, like everything else, work better in parallel than they do in series. And that is what happens in this free enterprise city. When things are organized socialistically in a bureaucratic series, any increase in complexity increases the probability of failure. But when they're organized in a free enterprise parallel, an increase in complexity becomes an increase in diversity more capable of responding to dynamic quality, and thus an increase of the probability of success. It's this diversity and parallelism that make the city work. And not just the city. Our greatest national economic success, agriculture, is organized almost entirely in parallel. All life has parallelism built into it. Cells work in parallel. Most body organs work in parallel. Eyes, brains, lungs. Species operate in parallel. Democracies operate in parallel. Even science seems to operate best when it is organized through the parallelism of the scientific societies. It's ironic that although the philosophy of science leaves no room for any undefined or dynamic quality, it's science's unique organization for the handling of the dynamic that gives it its superiority. Science superseded old religious forms not because what it says is more true in any absolute sense, whatever that is, but because what it says is more dynamic. If scientists had simply said Copernicus was right and Ptolemy was wrong without any willingness to further investigate the subject, then science would have simply become another minor religious creed. But scientific truth has always contained an overwhelming difference from theological truth. It is provisional. Science always contains an eraser, a mechanism, whereby new dynamic insight could wipe out old static patterns without destroying science itself. Thus, science, unlike orthodox theology, has been able of continuous evolutionary growth. As Feeders had written on one of his slips, the pencil is mightier than the pen. That's the whole thing, to obtain static and dynamic quality simultaneously. If you don't have the static patterns of scientific knowledge to build upon, you're back with the caveman. But if you don't have the freedom to change those patterns, you're blocked from any further growth. You can see that where political institutions have improved throughout the centuries, the improvement can usually be traced to a static dynamic combination, a king or constitution to preserve the static, and a parliament or jury that can act as a dynamic eraser, a mechanism whereby new dynamic insight can wipe out old static patterns without destroying the government itself. Peters was surprised by the conciseness of a commentary on Robert's rules of order that seem to capture the whole thing in two sentences. No minority has a right to block a majority from conducting the legal business of the organization. No majority has a right to prevent a minority from peacefully attempting to become a majority. The power of those two sentences is that they can create a stable, static situation where dynamic quality can flourish. In the abstract, at least, when you get to the particular, it's not so simple. It seems as though any static mechanism that is open to dynamic quality must also be open to degeneracy, to falling back to lower forms of reality. This creates the problem of getting maximum freedom from the emergence of dynamic quality while prohibiting degeneracy from destroying the evolutionary gains of the past. 
Americans like to talk about all their freedom, but they think it's disconnected from something Europeans often see in America, the degeneracy that goes with the dynamic. It seems though a society that is intolerant of all forms of degeneracy shuts off its own dynamic growth and becomes static. But a society that tolerates all forms of degeneracy degenerates. Either direction can be dangerous. The mechanism by which a balanced society grows and does not degenerate are difficult, if not possible, to define. How can you tell the two directions apart? Both oppose the status quo. Radical idealists and degenerate hooligans sometimes strongly resemble each other. Jazz was considered degenerate music when it first appeared. Modern art was considered degenerate. When you define morality scientifically as that which enhances evolution, it sounds as though you have really solved the problem of what morality is. But then, when you try to say specifically what is and what isn't evolution, and where evolution is going, you find you're right back in the soup again. The problem is, you can't really say whether specific change is evolutionary at the time it occurs. It is only with a century or so of hindsight that it appears evolutionary. For example, there is no way those Zuni priests would have known that this fellow that they were hanging by their thumbs was going to turn into some future savior of their tribe. Here was a drunken, bragging window peeper who told the authorities they could all go to hell and they couldn't do anything to him. What were they supposed to do? What else could they do? They couldn't let every damned degenerate in Zuni do as he pleased on the ground that he might, at some future date, save the tribe. They had to enforce the rules to hold the tribe together. This is really the central problem in the static dynamic conflict of evolution. How do you tell the saviors from the degenerates, particularly when they look alike, talk alike, and break all the rules alike? Freedoms that save the saviors also save the degenerates and allow them to tear the whole society apart. But restrictions that stop the degenerates also stop the creative dynamic forces of evolution. It was almost a custom for people to come to New York, prophesy a doomsday of one sort or another, and then wait for it to descend. They're doing it right now. But so far the doomsday has never come. New York will always be going to hell, but somehow it never gets there. Always changing, always changing for the worse, it seems. But then, right in the middle of the worst, comes this new dynamic thing that nobody ever heard of before. And the worst is forgotten because this new dynamic thing, which is also getting worse, has taken its place. What looks like hell always turns out to be something else. When something new and dynamic wants to come into the world, it often looks like hell. But it can get born in New York. It can happen. It seems like it could happen anywhere, but that's not so. It has to be a certain kind of people who can look at it and say, hey, wait a second, that's good, without having to look over their shoulder to see if someone else is saying the same thing. That's rare. This is one of those few places in the world where people don't ask whether something's been approved somewhere else. That, Fiedrich's thought, is how the metaphysics of quality explains the incredible contrasts of the best and the worst one sees here. Both exist in such terrific intensity because New York's never been committed to any preservation of its static patterns. It's always ready to change, whether you are or not. That's what creates the horror, and that is what creates its power. Its strength is its looseness. It's the freedom to be so awful that gives it the freedom to be so good. And things keep happening here all the time that have this dynamic sparkle that saves it all in the midst of everything that's wrong. It sparkles. Like the kids. You don't see them, but they're here, growing like mushrooms in secret places. Once Fiedrus went to a museum, on a weekday morning, and there were hundreds of them pointing at all the minerals and dinosaurs and grabbing each other's arms and holding hands, laughing and watching their teacher from time to time to see if everything was all right. Then suddenly they all vanished, and it was as though they had never been there. What you see in New York depends on your static patterns. What makes the city dynamic is the way it always busts up whatever those patterns are. This morning in the restaurant, this black, jet black, thug like guy with a dirty wool cap pulled over his head comes in. Dirty blue satin sports jacket, Reebok shoes also dirty, orders a coffee, which they have to serve him because it's the law. And then what does he do? Does he pull out a gun? No. Guess again. He pulls out the New York Times. He starts reading. It's the book review section. He's some kind of intellectual. This is New York. Wham! You're always seeing something you're not set up to see. It's not been all bad, this rich, poor contrast. 
When you pass a lot of static laws to cut out the worst, the best goes with it. The sparkle disappears, and what's left is just a lot of suburban blandness. It's been a psychological fuel that's jet-propelled a lot of people into doing things they might have been too lazy to do otherwise. If everybody here had the same income, same clothes, same background, same opportunities, the whole city would go dead. It's this physical proximity, an incredible social gulf, that gives its place such power. The city brings everyone up a notch, or down ten notches, or up a hundred notches. It sorts them all out. It's always been that way. Millions of rich and poor all mixed together. Skyscrapers and parks, diamond tiaras in the windows, and drunken vomit on the street. It really shocks you and motivates you. The devil is taking the hindmost right before your eyes. And just beyond the beggars go the frontmost, chauffeur assisted, into their stretch limousines. Yow! Keep moving. Don't slow down. You see the people who smile at you and are ready to cheat you. Sometimes you miss the ones who scowl at you but secretly support you in every way they can. When you talk to them, they treat you with a ten-foot pole, but at the other end, you sense the guarded affection. They're just survivors whose rough edges are all worn smooth. That's how the celebrity of a city works. It was getting darker now and colder, too. An edge of depression was approaching. Sooner or later, it always appeared. The adrenaline was about normal now and still dropping. His walking had slowed it down. Pedras reached what he recognized was the edge of Central Park. It was windier here from the northwest. That's what was bringing all this cold weather. The trees were dark now and billowing heavily in the wind. They still had their leaves probably because it was nearer to the ocean here and warmer than back at Troy and Kingston. As he walked along, he saw the park still kept its quiet, genteel look, despite everything. Of all the monuments the Victorians left to the city, this masterpiece of Olmsted and Vos was the greatest, he thought. If money and power and vanity were all they were interested in, why was this place here? He wondered what the Victorians would think about it now. The skyscrapers all around it would astonish them. They would like the way the trees had grown so big. He had an old Courier and Ives print of the park that showed the park almost barren of trees. Probably they would think the park was fine. Everywhere else in New York, they would have other opinions. They certainly put their stamp on the city. It's still here, under all the Art Deco and Bauhaus. The Victorians were the ones who really built New York up, he thought. And it's still their city deep down inside. When all their brown stones and their ornate pilasters and entablatures went out of style. They were considered the apotheosis of ugliness, but now, as their buildings get fewer every year, they give a nice accent to all the 20th century slick. Victorian Rococo brickwork and stonework and ironwork. God, how they loved ornateness. It went with their language. The final ultimate proof of their rise from the savages. They really thought they had done it in the city. Everywhere you still see little signs of what they thought about the city, all the baroque brownstone friezes and gargoyles, waiting for the wreckers' ball, the riveted iron bridges in Central Park, their wonderful museums, the lions in front of the public library. They were sculpting an image of themselves. All this unnecessary ornateness they left behind, that wasn't just vanity. There was a lot of love in it, too. They gussied the city up partly because they loved it. They paid for all these gargoyles and ornamental ironwork, the way a newly rich father might buy a fancy dress for a daughter he's proud of. It's easy to condemn them as pretentious snobs since they openly invited that opinion and ignore the history that made them that way. They did everything they could to ignore that history themselves. What the Victorians never wanted you to know was that actually they were nothing more than a bunch of rich hicks. For the most part, they were rural, backwater, religion-bound people who, after the Civil War had disrupted their lives, suddenly found themselves in the middle of an industrial age. There was no precedent for it. They really had no guidelines for what to do with themselves. The possibilities of steel and steam and electricity and science and engineering were dazzling. They were getting rich beyond their wildest dreams, and the money pouring in showed no signs of ever stopping. And so a lot of the things they were later condemned for, their love of snobbery and gingerbread architecture and ornamental cast iron, were just the mannerisms of decent people who were trying to live up to all this. The only wealthy models available were the European aristocracy. What we tend to forget is that, unlike the European aristocrats they aped, the American Victorians were very creative people. The telephone, the telegraph, and the railroad. 
the transatlantic cable, the light bulb, the radio, the phonograph, the motion pictures, and the techniques of mass production, almost all these great technological changes that are associated with the 20th century are, in fact, American Victorian inventions. The city is composed of their value patterns. It was their optimism, their belief in the future, their codes of craftsmanship and labor and thrift and self-discipline that really built 20th century America. Since the Victorians disappeared, the entire drift of the century has been toward a dissipation of these values. You could imagine some old Victorian aristocrat coming back to these streets, looking around, and the becoming stony-faced at what he saw. Theodore saw it was nearly dark. He was almost at his hotel now. As he crossed the street, he noticed a gust of wind swirling dust and scraps of paper up from the pavement before the lights of the taxi. A sign on top of the taxi said, See the Big Apple, and under it, the name of some tour line with a telephone number, the Big Apple. He could almost feel the disgust with which a Victorian would greet that name. They never thought of New York City that way. The Big Opportunity, or the Big Future, or the Empire City would have been closer to their vision. They saw the city as a monument to their own greatness, not something they were devouring. The mentality that sees New York as a Big Apple, a Victorian might say, is the mentality of a worm. And then he might add, to be sure, the worm means the name only as a compliment. But that is because the worm has no idea of what the effects of his eating the Big Apple are. The hotel doorman seemed to recognize Peters as he approached and opened the gold-lettered monogrammed glass door with a professional smile and flourish. But as Peters smiled back, he realized the doorman probably seemed to recognize everybody who came in. That was his role, part of the New York illusion. Inside the lobby's world of subdued guilt and plush suggested Victorian elegance without denying the advantages of 20th century modernity. Only the howl of wind at the crack between the elevator doors reminded him of the world outside. In the elevator, he thought about the vertical winds that must be in all these buildings and wondered if there were compensating vertical downdrafts outside. Probably not. The hot elevator winds would just keep rising into the sky until they left the building. Cold air would fill in from horizontal currents on the streets. The room had been cleaned since he had left, and the bed had been made. He dropped the heavy canvas sack of mail on it. He wouldn't have much time to read mail now. That walk had taken longer than he thought it would. But he felt sort of tired and relaxed, and that felt good. He turned on the living room light and heard a buzzing sound by the bulb. At first he thought it was a loose bulb, but then he saw that the buzzing was coming from a large moth. He watched for a moment and wondered. How did it get up this high in the sky? He thought moths stayed close to the ground. It blended with the Victorian decor of the place as it fluttered around in the lampshade. It must be a Victorian moth, he thought, aspiring eternally to higher things and then reaching its goal, burning to death and falling to the dust below. Victorians loved that kind of imagery. Peters went to a large glass door that seemed to open onto a balcony. There was too much reflection from the room to see what was on the other side, so he opened it a little. Through the opening, he could see the night sky and far away, the random patterns of window lights in other skyscrapers. He opened the door wider, stepped out onto the balcony, and felt the cold air. It was windy up here and high, too. He could see he was almost at a level with the tops of the buildings way over on the other side of the huge dark space of Central Park. The balcony seemed to be made of some sort of gray stone, but it was too dark to see. He stepped to the stone rail and looked over. Yow! Way down there, the cars were like little ladybugs. They were yellow, most of them, and they crawled along slowly, just like bugs. The yellow ones must be taxis. They moved so slowly. One of them pulled to the curb directly below him and stopped. Then Fedris could see a speck that had to be a person get out and go into the entrance he himself had come in. He wondered how long it would take to fall all the way down there. Thirty seconds? Less than that, he figured. Thirty seconds is a long time. Five seconds would be more like it. The thought started a tingling in his body. It rose to his head and made him dizzy. He stepped back carefully. He looked up for a while. 
The sky was not really a night sky. It was filled with the same orange glow he and Lila had seen in Nyack. Only much more intense now. He supposed it was atmospheric pollution or even normal sea mist, or dust reflecting the streetlights from below back down from the sky. But it gave a feeling of not being really outdoors at all. The giant of a city even dominated the sky. How quiet it was now, almost serene. Strange that way up here, looking down on all the noise and jangle and tension below, is this upper zone of silence. You don't even think about it when you're down in the street. No wonder multimillionaires paid huge sums for a space up here in the sky. They could endure all that competitive life down there when they had a place like this up here to retreat to. The giant could be very good to you, he thought, if it wanted to.